Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to be here together, to be in community, to be not alone. Pray that tonight you would speak through your word, that what I say would be not important, but what you say through me. And all God's people said, amen. Uh, Some of you may know, I am the oldest of three siblings. My brother Andy was a rock intern a couple years ago. He's down in medical school. Some of you know him. Yeah, Andy Koth. He's a skinny man. Uh, You can break him in half, maybe. Uh, And when we were... Feedback. When we were waiting for our younger sister to be born, one of the questions that our parents asked us a lot was, well, what do, you, what do you want to name your baby sister? What do you want to name the new baby that's coming? And I don't, I don't remember. I honestly, like I was trying to think the other day, like what I wanted to name her, and I honestly can't remember what I thought would be good. But I really remember that Andy was set. He had two names that he really liked for no matter what. He was like, I want to go with Butch or Spike. <laughs> that is it. Those are the names. This new baby sister, that's what I want. I mean, he was like three and a half, so it, told, like, it made perfect sense. Obviously, Butch or Spike is a great name for a baby, right? Like, let's go with it, Mom and Dad. Come on, I don't see what the problem is. So, but my parents did not pick Butch or Spike for my sister because names are an important thing. They give us, in part, an identity. I mean, when we hear sort of those crazy celebrity baby names, we're like, yeah, why would you name your kid Denim? It's a fabric. <laughs> yeah, not so much a name. So names are very important, and they're not only important to us in our culture, they are also important in the Bible. Um, we have those, has anybody ever tried to read any of those genealogies, the long lists of names? Dan, I saw you raise your hand, don't be shy, it's Okay. Anybody else tried to read any genealogies? Kelly. Okay, we got some up here. That's good. Yes, it's good. So they're in there for a reason. They're not just like, oh, let's think of all the hardest names we can put in one long list, and that will fool everyone. Mwahaha. No, they're there because it is telling a story. Names are important in the Bible. And um, there is not only names of people in the Bible that are important, but... Names of God. And over Christmas, I got to spend some time with my boyfriend's family down in Florida, and his grandmother was there, Grandma Earlene. So in case you wanted to know, there is a feminine form of Earl. It's Earlene, if you want to name your kid that someday. There you go. So Grandma Earlene is like the sweetest lady ever, and she gave me these cards. And I have a picture of them, these little cards. And on these cards are all these different names of God from the Bible. Erlene used to teach all these Bible classes all over the state of Michigan, and she used to have a Bible radio show, so she's like super into all this stuff. So she gave me these cards, which maybe one day, if you are lucky, I will send you one in the mail. Real mail, exciting, not just an email. But these are just a listing of all the variety of names of God that are found In the Old Testament. So names are very key, not only of people, but of God. And names are going to be important for the story that we're looking at tonight as we continue our series called Old Testament New Stories, looking at some of the lesser known characters in the Old Testament. So how we're going to start out is I'm going to read the story. 16 verses. It's kind of long. So stick with me. You'll have the verses up there to follow along, and then we're going to come back and break it down. So, from Genesis 16. Whoa, it turned small, but that's fine. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian servant, Hagar, 
and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said to Hagar, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. And the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. And you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. And she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that's why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So, that's the story of Hagar, the story we're looking at tonight. Our lesser known figure from the Old Testament. So if we go back to the beginning of this story and we look at it, we see that there's some characters who are named here. We see Sarai, we see Abram, who later become, any guesses? Any guesses? Abraham and Sarah, good job. Somebody was paying attention in Sunday school. But if you notice, I've highlighted in green here, Sarai never calls Hagar by her name. Not once. She's only called my servant, my servant, and Abraham calls her your servant. She has a name. We know it. The narrator gives it to us. But all she is to Abraham, to Abram and Sarai is a servant. Her name is not important. And so Sarai just sees her as a tool to increase her, to get some descendants. And back in this time in the Old Testament, it was very important to have a family, to carry on your name so that future generations would happen. And God had promised Abraham, just a chapter back, I'm going to make you have descendants as numerous as the stars. And Sarah's like, Sarah's like, I'm getting old, biological clock, what's going on, God? Come on, we need some uh, descendants here. Oh, wait, I have this girl. She's a servant, so I can do with her whatever I want. She's going to get me some descendants, because that's really important. That's what I need. That's going to keep our family going. That's how God's promise is going to be realized to us. So Hagar, just, Hagar is just seen as nothing but a slave, nothing but a servant, nothing but a tool in the hands of Sarai and Abram. And then, as we see at the end of this verse, Sarai mistreats Hagar because she is this, this tool, this no-name, this servant girl. Sarai feels okay abusing and using her. And this word mistreat here is the same word that later in the Exodus story is going to be used to describe the way that the Egyptians oppress the Israelites. It's that severe. It's that intense. It's that kind of abuse that leads Hagar, the no-name servant girl, out into the wilderness. So what happens next? Well, then Hagar's out, and the angel of the Lord finds her. 
And notice what happens in verse 8. The angel says immediately, Hagar, by name, Hagar. Basically, what are you doing here? Why are you out in the middle of nowhere by yourself? And Hagar's simple reply is, you know, I'm trying to escape this hard life of abuse, of oppression under this mistress who sees me as nothing but a tool and a servant. And then we have a little moment of tension because God tells her to go back to that. That's strange. Why should she go back there? That's mistreatment. That's oppression. So we have that. And we also have God saying through the angel in the next second, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Hagar gets the same promise that Abram got just a chapter before this. This no-name slave girl gets a promise of descendants too numerous to count. So there's this tension there. Go back and submit to your mean, oppressive mistress. But this is also going to happen for you. Both these things are happening in Hagar's life in this story. And what you guys should know in this passage that is unique is that Hagar is the first person in the book of Genesis that's encountered by an angel of the Lord. First person. She's not even Hebrew. She's an Egyptian. She's a slave. And an angel of the Lord comes to her as she's running away in the middle of nowhere and meets her there and calls her by name. Second thing in this passage that I want you to notice is that she is the first woman in the Bible given a promise by God, I will make your descendants numerous, too numerous to count. We had Abram get that promise. Sarai didn't get it. But here Hagar gets this promise. That's amazing. This oppressed and abused girl with no rights gets this promise. And then what happens next is also very unique about Hagar and where names come into play again. She says, she gives this name to the Lord who speaks to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Hagar is the only person in the entire Old Testament to give a name to God. The only person. You go through the whole Old Testament. Only Hagar is someone who has an experience of encountering God and names God based out of that experience. Says, God, you saw me. No one else saw me. They saw me as just someone to be used, to get what they wanted, someone to be harmed. But God, you saw me here in my time of need. So I'm going to call you the one who sees me, the one who sees me in the wilderness when I'm alone. And then the, the promise of Ishmael, the, the promise of her descendants begins to be fulfilled as her son is born. And there's more to this story of Hagar, which we're not going to go into tonight in Genesis 21, and I would encourage you to look at that. But for tonight, this story is the one that we're looking at. The story of this no-name girl who names God. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. As I read over this story of Hagar this week and thought about it um, over the past month or two, um, I couldn't help but make the connection um, between this movie that I saw recently um, called Precious. And Precious, um, there's a little 
picture of it. It's Precious is up in the left corner. And it's a story, it's the story of this girl. And her name is Precious, which, you know, you would think would connote her value to people. But she is not valued at all. I mean, this movie, my... I told my roommate when I went with her, I was like, this is not going to be the feel-good movie of 2010. I'm just warning you. And it's not. It is hard. It is painful. Her own mother never, her own mother calls her fat and stupid and ugly and things that I can't even say in church. Yet she has this name, Precious. But nobody ever thinks of her as precious. They just think of her like Hagar, someone abused, someone to be used for what they want out of her. And then one day, she goes to this new school. And while she's there, she, she starts coming out of her shell a little more through this teacher, Miss Rains. And one day, towards the end of the movie, Precious is sitting in class and how Miss Rains has kind of helped these troubled girls is by having them write in these journals. And Precious is finally getting the courage to tell her own story about the abuse she suffered at the hands of her mother and her father and everyone around her, basically. And she starts crying. And she, she never cries. She's always very strong. And Miss Rains squats down. And she, she says, tell your story. Write your story. Tell us who you are. And she says, she, she, she tries to shake her off, and she says, no, no, nobody loves me. I'm nothing. And Miss Rains looks her in the eye, and she says, I love you. She, Miss Rains, sees Precious. She sees her in her wilderness of being alone and abused and hurt and not, being, not feeling precious at all. Miss Rains meets her there with love. It was a powerful moment for me, and it really made me think of how God meets Hagar in that wilderness, in that place of emptiness and aloneness. And I know that most of us, it's my hope, I guess, that most of us don't experience the kind of oppression or abuse that Precious or Hagar have gone through. But I think we can relate to Hagar's story in a couple of ways. And those are, we can relate to her isolation and her confusion Think about, think about this past year for you or any time in your life when you felt alone and maybe there hasn't been an angel asking, where are you going? Where are you coming from? Like there was for Hagar. But you've been running away from something and you've been wondering Where is the God who sees me? Where is the God who hears me? Where is the God who acts in my life? Where are you? Where are you? So we relate to Hagar's isolation and confusion as she's out in the middle of that wilderness. We might not be running from an abusive mistress. But I think we can all think of things that we have run from in our life that are hard and difficult to face. And the second thing that I think we can connect with in Hagar's story is the fact that her story is a story in progress. You know, her story that we read tonight it wasn't over. And I think that's what I love about the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible. It's not all about, let's tie it up, make it all pretty, happy ending. Um, 
One of my favorite books in the Old Testament is the book of Jonah. It has the weirdest ending ever. Because Jonah is this prophet, and he's like, God, why did you save the Ninevites? I can't believe you did this. I hate you, da-da-da. And God's like, why should I not be merciful to them and save them? And also many cattle, basically, is you know bad paraphrase of that. But that's kind of how it ends. It's like this, like, what? Jonah doesn't even get, like, a last word at all. But I, I love how the Old Testament does that because it, it makes you think, what's going to happen next? How is God going to work in this story? And there are things in this story we don't understand. I talked about that tension of go back to Sarai. Why? But the promise of the descendants. And I think we experience that too in our lives. A tension of, of things that are hard and things that are good. And that's real life. I think sometimes we think that, you know, Christianity is, we've got all the answers and we never live in a gray area anymore. I think a lot of people like to think that once you have Christian faith, black and white, it becomes so easy. I think it becomes a lot harder to think about where is God in, in situations of tension like this. What's going on there? How is God working in this story that's in progress? So I think we can connect to that. So my challenge for you tonight, before we go into a time of prayer, uh, led by Ben, is to know that that God will meet you in, in your place of isolation or confusion. I've experienced that in my life, and sometimes it takes a while. It's not overnight. And also, I know that you're a story in progress. I believe God started something in each one of your lives, and he's working it out. Nobody in this room is perfect. None of us has a a perfect faith but we're a work in progress and that's a beautiful thing because we get to do it together and we get to encourage each other as we do it let's pray real quick God I pray that this week we would remember that you see us and that we are a work in progress that you are not done writing the story of our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.